There are almost no similarities between Earth and Jupiter. Ours is a sweet, small planet with plants and cute pandas. Jupiter is a giant gas horror with furious hurricanes which never subside. And if you fall into this planet, you might literally fly through it. But what would happen if our Earth was the size of the father of the solar system? Oh, this is going to be fun. Jupiter is a planet so big that I bet you can't even imagine its scale. Its radius is about 11 times the radius of Earth, and it's about 316 times more massive. So, to turn Earth into another Jupiter, we'd need to increase its radius by 11 times. If the planet's density remained the same, then the mass of our new Earth would increase greatly. Actually, it'd be as much as four times larger than Jupiter's. Of course, these changes wouldn't go smoothly. The very first thing that we would immediately notice, nope, not the size, gravity. It would increase by about 11 times compared to old Earths. Scientists say we can actually survive on a planet with greater gravity, but only if it's less than five times stronger than what we have now. Well, let's assume that we're daredevils, always ready to challenge nature. What would our life be like? Well, not very pleasant. After each step, you'd have to sit down on a bench and take a break, as if you've just run a marathon. Yes, it would be that hard to walk. Oh, and good luck with getting up later. In order to somehow move around this planet, we'd have to pump up very strong muscles. No more problems with junk food, because you'd have to become a heavy lifter just to get to the refrigerator. The force of gravity affects not only movement, but also the size of everything. Do you know that many astronauts gain some height due to weightlessness in space? So if you're worried about being short, here's a solution for you. On the other hand, strong gravity would make us all shorter. This would go not only for humans, but for everything on our planet. Trees would become very small. To grow upward, they would have to move water from their roots to branches which would be unrealistic with such gravity. So they'd all turn into little bushes. Also, no more mountains. Even the largest ones would become very small. But at least now, everyone would be able to conquer Everest. This would also apply to animals. Our pets would have to quickly evolve into pumped up corgis just to be able to walk somehow. Oh, and say goodbye to birds, of course. If you think that's not enough suffering, let's add another thing. It would be very difficult for us to breathe. Atmospheric pressure would increase dramatically. That's because Earth would start to pull air toward itself with great force. You'd literally feel the weight of it on your shoulders. Remember what I said about taking a break after each step? Now, imagine that you'd also have to breathe through a pillow. Yeah. And that's not all. Atmospheric pressure plays an important role in the behavior of water molecules. It would be much more difficult for water to boil or turn into ice. Most icebergs would melt, and it's possible that we'd have no more clouds, too. All water vapor would come crashing down on us in giant torrents of rain. We'd be lucky if we didn't get flooded instantly. But, oddly enough, there would also be some advantages. For example, Everything around us would become much more spacious. Assuming we didn't get flooded, there would even be a bunch of deserted areas on the planet. Maybe land prices would finally fall. But these unexplored areas would most likely remain unexplored, since we'd hardly be able to travel across seas and oceans. Not only because moving across the water would be incredibly difficult, but also because all water bodies on the planet would become 10 times larger. The very thought of getting lost in the ocean is frightening, but imagine if it was 10 times deeper and bigger? Uh-oh. So, no more sailing. And forget about flying by plane, or visiting space ever again. But it seems like it's still not all. If Earth was the size of Jupiter, we'd also have volcanoes raging everywhere. Due to the increase in its mass, Earth would become terribly unstable. All extinct volcanoes would become active again, 
and there would be lava and poisonous gases everywhere. In 1883, there was the most destructive eruption in the history of humankind, the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano. It occurred on one small island, but people all over the planet could feel the consequences. The eruption destroyed the island, triggered many tsunamis, and clouds of poisonous gases spread for miles. Now imagine this, but 10 times worse. That's what would happen on our Jupiter-sized Earth. It would probably be similar to the fall of the Chicxulub meteorite, the one that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. Then, poisonous gases spread all over the planet, causing one of the greatest massive extinctions in the history of Earth. Oh, and we would also lose the magnetic field, like the cherry on top of the cake. The magnetic field is very important for life on Earth. According to Rory Barnes from the University of Washington, it shields life on the planet from the nastiness of space, which means all sorts of radiation and solar winds. There's a molten iron core inside our planet that is responsible for producing the magnetic field. If the amount of pressure on this core increased due to gravity, it could solidify. And because of this, Earth's magnetic field would disappear. We would be exposed to the effects of cosmic radiation. Too scary to even imagine. All right, so now we know that living on this new Earth would be a real nightmare. But what about outer space? You've probably heard that Jupiter, thanks to its strong gravity, protects us from asteroids. Well, this would become our job. Jupiter experiences about 24,000 collisions a year. And now, it'd be our destiny. Do you remember me mentioning the Chicxulub meteorite? Similar tragedies happen to our planet once every 100 million years or so. But if it became the size of Jupiter, these guys would visit us every Friday. Also, we'd have to say bye-bye to the moon. Our natural satellite is too close to us. So if Earth grew in size, it would be a real catastrophe. We would literally watch the moon being torn apart in the sky. Of course, after that, all these fragments would crash into us. One of the theories claims that billions of years ago, the moon somehow separated from Earth and its pieces gathered into a ball. Now, it would be like watching its creation rewind. And even if the moon survived, somehow remaining in Earth's orbit, the changes in the tides would still be dramatic. The consequences of these changes would be very unpredictable, but probably a bunch of tsunamis would be some of them. On the other hand, we'd probably gain a couple of new moons. Jupiter has as many as 79 of them. It would probably be a spectacular view, if only gas clouds from all those volcanic eruptions didn't block it. Also, the appearance of a second giant planet would have significant consequences for the whole solar system. Don't worry, other planets wouldn't crash into us. Many people underestimate just how far the planets are from one another. But still, the new Earth would shift the orbits of other planets a little and affect the rotation speed. And Earth itself would rotate around the Sun much more slowly because of its huge mass. For example, one year equals 12 Earth years on Jupiter. All this, of course, would greatly affect seasons and the climate in general. So, would there be life on Earth? Bold of you to even ask this question. But if one day we do manage to find a habitable super-Earth close to Jupiter in size, it would be very interesting to take a look at it. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. 
but it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface, which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts, this is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride. You know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the Red Planet, and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen, 
And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there, it can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter or famous gas giants. But on Venus, totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere, but not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious, but they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. Jupiter, the fastest spinning planet in our solar system, with a day lasting only 10 hours. The biggest planet in our solar system, a gas giant more than 300 times as massive as Earth. It has rings of dust and colorful bands stretching across its surface, which are actually gases. And then there's the Great Red Spot, Iconic raging storm, huge hurricane, two to three times as wide as the whole Earth. It's also insanely deep and goes around 300 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. That's 40 times as deep as the Mariana Trench, the deepest oceanic spot on Earth. Way more extensive than scientists expected. Researchers have speculated about the Great Red Spot for hundreds of years already. This storm is circling Jupiter in its southern hemisphere. At the center of this giant spinning storm, the winds are relatively calm. On the edges, wind speeds go up to 425 miles per hour. That's twice as faster than the strongest hurricanes on our planet, 175 miles per hour. When there's a hurricane on Earth, it goes wild at first, but eventually starts to slow down. It finally breaks apart when it reaches solid land. Jupiter has a sky that's 44 miles deep. There are layers of clouds, and beneath them, scientists believe, lies an ocean of liquid hydrogen. The planet's core is supposed to be right under that ocean, but we're still not sure what exactly it's made of. As far as we know, Jupiter is a gas world, so there's no solid ground that would stop the storm. That's why the spot continues to rage on and on. Scientists realize the storm is constantly changing its size. Compared to data from 1850, it's shrinking right now. The Great Red Spot used to be three times the size of Earth. It's been a long time since it last got bigger. As it's shrinking, the storm gets taller and changes color into an intense orange, possibly because of the chemical reactions. New matter raises from the bottom of the storm. The Red Great Spot could continue shrinking and eventually disappear in the next 10 to 20 years. But there could be another similar storm emerging somewhere else on Jupiter. If the Red Great Spot ever ends, 
This storm might seem very deep, but it's still shallower than the giant jets of wind that rage around it, empower the storm even more. Jupiter's bands of wind go to depths of 2,000 miles below its cloud tops. Jupiter is generally known for having crazy windy conditions in the upper and lower parts of the atmosphere. The middle part is called the stratosphere, and we didn't know what was going on there. Scientists usually measure wind power by watching clouds, and there are no clouds in the stratosphere. But when a comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, collided with Jupiter in 1994, scientists got a chance to study cometary structure and composition and its effects on Jupiter's atmosphere. They discovered insanely strong winds in the stratosphere with speeds of 900 miles per hour. Jupiter isn't the only planet in our solar system with crazy weather. Mars has the biggest dust storms amongst all eight planets. When such a storm is raging, it seems like it creates a blanket over the entire planet that lasts for months. One theory that tries to explain why dust storms are so big on Mars says airborne particles of dust absorb sunlight and warm the planet's atmosphere. This creates warm pockets of air. They start flowing toward colder areas, which then generates winds. These winds lift dust off the ground, which heats the atmosphere, makes winds stronger, and kicks up more dust. Mars generally has a very thin atmosphere. It mostly consists of carbon dioxide, and the volume of gases in the Martian atmosphere is less than 1% of that of our planet. But Mars used to be much wetter and warmer than it is today. That means its atmosphere was much thicker a long time ago. It created a strong greenhouse effect and trapped the sunlight. Mars used to have a pretty strong magnetic field. Just like on Earth, the magnetic field on Mars was created by currents of molten metals in its core. But unlike our planet, the inside of Mars cooled enough to switch off the magnetic field. Without it, Mars wasn't protected from the solar wind. That's a powerful stream of particles flowing from our sun. It took only a couple of hundred million years, which is not much in space terms, for the solar wind to strip away most of the atmosphere on Mars. It went quickly because the sun used to rotate much faster at its earlier stages, so the solar wind was more powerful and energetic. And that's how Mars turned from a planet with a warm, wet climate into the cold, dry place it is today. Mars also has some interesting glaciers. They've been on its surface for hundreds of millions of years and can tell us secrets of the planet's past. For instance, that's how we found out Mars went through 6 to 20 separate ice ages during the past 300 to 800 million years. Satellites took images of 60,000 rocks of different sizes. They were distributed across the entire planet at random. If Mars had a single, long ice age, we'd find a progression of bigger to smaller rocks because they erode as time goes by. But the rocks were spread in clear bands of debris across the surface of these glaciers. Each band marked a different flow of ice, which means each of them formed during a different ice age. These glaciers are like time capsules because they could have all kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes trapped inside. That means they could help us understand the changes in climate on Mars and tell us if there used to be any form of life on the planet. And the best thing, we don't need to drill deep down below the crust to find that out. Everything's on the surface. If you could go back in time, let's say 4 billion years, and visit the red planet, you'd probably see chaotic scenes of flooding. Scientists believe that mega flood happened because of a huge meteorotic impact. Because of the heat from that impact, ice on the planet's surface started melting. This flood carved out big ripples and waves in the sedimentary rock. Some wave-shaped features are over 30 feet high and spaced out 450 feet apart. Saturn also has its own unique weather conditions. Lightning bolts there can be 10,000 times more powerful than the ones we have on Earth. NASA's Cassini spacecraft was orbiting Saturn from 2004 to 2017. It captured lightning so strong and intense, we could see it even during the daytime. Cassini also recorded the sounds of those intense storms discharged into the planet's atmosphere. From time to time, Saturn has giant storms that go over 190,000 miles across the surface. They encircle nearly the entire planet. On Saturn's North Pole, there's a massive hexagon of clouds. It's a vortex of a pretty unusual shape that circulates hundreds of miles above the clouds and extends deep into the planet. But Saturn has its peaceful side too. Along with Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, it has its own beautiful auroras from time to time. All four planets have an atmosphere dominated by hydrogen. That's why you can only see these auroras in ultraviolet wavelengths. These northern lights are especially bright at dusk and right before midnight. 
Venus has a giant storm swirling in the atmosphere at its south pole. The vortex is as big as the entirety of Europe, and it's probably been there for a very long time. The atmosphere on Venus moves 60 times faster than the planet rotates. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. Even the rain there offers no relief, since it's sulfuric acid falling from clouds and evaporating before it even gets to the ground. The sun also has its own angry outbursts in the shape of powerful solar storms. These storms bring strong radiation and dust particles that can cause serious damage to satellites that track the sun's activity to let us know if something goes wrong. Every now and then, a crazy solar storm can catch us off guard. About 160 years ago, a strong solar flare caused severe issues in global telegraph communications. About 30 years ago, a solar flare left 6 million people without electricity for 9 hours. One theory says strong solar activity could have caused the sinking of the Titanic. It happened on the same night as a fascinating northern light show. Some people believe a solar storm behind it had possibly disrupted the ship's communication systems and navigation, leading to one of the greatest unsolved mysteries ever.